Good afternoon and welcome to today's virtual congressional briefing on family and youth homelessness in the wake of COVID-19. Next slide, please. My name is Barbara Duffield and I am the executive director of Schoolhouse Connection. We are one of four national organizations that are co-hosting this briefing series. We are joined by our partners, the National Network for Youth, First Campaign, First Focus Campaign for Children, and Family Promise. Before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of logistics with respect to the webinar technology. Um, if you do have a question, please, answer, please, please put any questions that you have into the questions pane and click send, and that way we'll see the questions and we'll be able to get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, please also know that with respect to this PowerPoint and other handouts, an archive is being recorded and an archive will be available on the web link on the PowerPoint slide. Please also know that the PowerPoint and our policy fact sheets are available currently for you under the handouts panel. And if you've signed up for this webinar, you'll automatically get an email with a link to the recording after the webinar is over. Prior to COVID-19, public schools and early childhood programs nationally reported a record number of homeless children and youth, 1.5 million K through 12, and for under age six, 1.4 million. We expect these numbers will increase in the wake of health and economic crises caused by COVID-19. Unable to stay at home or social distance, often staying in crowded conditions and forced to move frequently, most of these children and youth are not protected by current or proposed eviction moratoria, nor are they eligible for emergency homeless assistance. Despite their high risk for transmission, infection, illness, and other harm, Homeless children, youth, and families have largely been absent from national discussion on COVID-19. And this is why we have organized three unique bipartisan briefings to bring visibility and to learn from the real experts. Last Tuesday, we heard from four youth and young adults. Last Thursday, we heard from four parents. And both of those briefings are now archived and available for viewing. Today, we'll hear from service providers and educators who are on the front lines of homelessness during COVID-19. And we are thrilled to be joined by U.S. Senators Joe Manchin and Lisa Murkowski. It is now my pleasure to introduce U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. Senator, we are so grateful for your leadership on child and youth homelessness, for your tireless work to help ensure that these children and youth have the education, the services, and the housing that they need to avoid homelessness as adults. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Barbara. First, I'd like to thank Schoolhouse Connection, uh, the National Network for Youth, the first focus campaign for children and family promise for putting this together. I know Barbara, Darla, Kara have been working with me in my office extensively over the past several months to address children and youth homelessness. I'd also like to thank Kim Martin from North Central West Virginia, my home area in the Fairmont area, and she's with Head Start, and she's a member of the panel, and I look forward to hearing from her and the others that have joined today. Finally, I would like to thank Senator Lisa Murkowski, my dear friend, for working with me on the Emergency Family Stabilization Act that will really impact children, youth, and families that are currently or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Just this week, the West Virginia Department of Education reported that there are more than 10,300 students experiencing homelessness in West Virginia. This number is slightly down from the previous year because schools across the state shut down in March due to the COVID-19 and school personnel were unable to accurately capture the student data after that. Every child deserves a loving, caring adult in their lives, and they also deserve a stable home to go to every night. I am committed to fighting for increased resources at the federal level to assist state and local communities in combating children and youth homelessness. The only way to reverse this cycle of poverty and youth homelessness is to combat this issue head on. Our nation today on childhood homelessness can change the trajectory of West Virginia for generations to come. And that's why I will continue to fight for West Virginia's homeless children and youth in every way possible until we reach our goal of zero homeless children in West Virginia. Even one child without a place to call home is one too many. As you all know, I introduced the Bipartisan Emergency Family Stabilization Act along with Senators Murkowski, Senator Sinema, and Senator Collins. This bill is necessary to assist families, children, and youth who are experiencing homelessness, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. This bill will provide critical services throughout or through the Administration for Children and Families, Department of Health and Human Services, using the broader McKinney-Vento definition. 
Specifically, it will provide PPE to families to assist with health visits, education costs, ensuring the families have access to vital federal programs to assist them and much, much more. A bipartisan companion bill will be introduced in the House in the next few days. We need Senate and House leadership to include this in the next COVID-19 relief package. So please ask your congressman and your senator or boss to support this legislation. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this fight. Together, we will ensure that every child has a safe place to call home and rest their head at night. Thank you and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much, Senator Manchin. It's truly really been an honor to work with you and your team on these important issues. And we thank you so much for joining us here today. And we look forward to continuing working together moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna have um, Senator Murkowski joining us soon. Um, and then we're gonna have a panel discussion, but we wanted to start with an introduction of the expert service provider and educator panelists that we have today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce everyone. Actually, if the panelists wanna do a one minute introduction, I think that would be great. Um, so please unmute yourself. We're gonna start with Charlotte. Yeah, hi, I'm Charlotte Kinsley. I'm the McKinney Vento liaison for Minneapolis Public Schools um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I work with our homeless and highly mobile students in our district. Um, and we last year had 2,500 students that we identified as experiencing homelessness. So very happy to be part of this important conversation. Great, and Kim? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Kim Martin. I'm the Children's Services Director for the Head Start and Early Head Start Program in North Central West Virginia, and I cover eight counties within our um, area. Great, and Allison? I'm Allison Kerr. I'm the Executive Director of Covenant House in Anchorage, Alaska, and we provide services to homeless runaway trafficked youth ages 13 to 24. Um, and we cover across the state of Alaska. Great, and David? Hey everyone, uh, David Baker. I am a youth assistance navigator for the uh, YMCA Youth and Family Services here in San Diego, California. I work primarily with youth aged uh, 18 to 25. However, uh, working with that population usually involves working with everyone else uh, from children all the way up until our elderly folks. Um, super honored to be here, excited to share uh, some of the experiences we've had down here and uh, definitely my expertise. So thank you all for having me. Brennan? Hi, I'm Brennan Graham. I'm the president and CEO for Growing Home Southeast based in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we provide um, services for children and families throughout South Carolina and in Southern Alabama. Um, foster care placement, mental health services, uh, transitional living services, and other community-based um, resources for children and families. I'm also a board member for the National Network for Youth, and I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you. Brennan. Melissa? I am Melissa Douglas. I am the Mental Homeless Liaison uh, for Kansas City Public Schools. Uh, we refer to ourselves as students in transition uh, because no one wants to be called homeless. Uh, but more importantly, we serve uh, in our uh, city, our urban area, um, roughly about uh, 1,500 um, homeless students uh, and youth or highly mobile homeless students and youth. And um, I am uh, very excited to be here. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, for those who are on their computer, you can download the speaker bios. Um, they're hyperlinked on this page and um, you can learn more about our expert panelists. Um, I should introduce myself. My name is Darla Bardine. I'm the executive director of the National Network for Youth. Uh, we, we partner with over 300 youth service providers across the country and with over 30 young people who've experienced homelessness across the country to transform systems to prevent um, and solve youth and young adult homelessness in America. 
So we are going to get started with round one of questions. And then um, when Senator Murkowski arrives, we will pause um, and listen to her. And then we'll go back to the panelists' discussions. And Barbara and I are going to kind of popcorn questions um, throughout this. And please put your questions in the question box as they arise. We will get to Q&A at the end. We also do have handouts about key policy goals um, and what we want to see in the next stimulus package. And we'll talk about, um, Barbara will talk about those recommendations towards the end. So the first question is directed to Allison. And the question is, how has COVID-19 impacted the health, stability, and well-being of the youth and young adults experiencing homelessness in Anchorage, Alaska, and, and Alaska more broadly. Thank you for that question. Um, it's been an interesting thing that as far as uh, cases of COVID, we've been fairly fortunate um, with a small amount. Um, but just like uh, Senator Munchen said, one experiencing it is too many. Um, the one thing that we have really seen is we've seen about a 300% increase in uh, under 18. So we're a program that primarily has done services for 18 to 24. And what we realized is during this hunker down phase, there were young people that it was really the school systems were saving young people and kind of their safety net. And when the schools went away, that safety net went away. Um, the stability of the families uh, were such that young people had no place to go and were, were on the streets. We saw more uh, new cases than we'd ever seen. Um, and I think in addition to that, we have, we're have one of the HUD demonstration projects. And so we had 70 young people that were just newly housed last year, within the last year, in their own apartments. Um, and the isolation that happened um, with COVID uh, was almost as devastating as the wave of unemployment and all the other things. Young people were alone in a space that uh, they had no one to kind of talk to. So we've, we've had to really navigate helping young people um, being connected in very different ways. So, you know, the, the stability of unemployment was devastating. We had 80, 88% of our kids that were newly housed lost their jobs. So it's the, you know, um, and, we've had real challenges getting them to be able to access unemployment and some of the benefits just because of the way it's structured and uh, so our young people are highly vulnerable and um, and we've seen that you know we've seen that vulnerability um, such an increase we're about 156 kids a night that we are um, providing space and supporting um, every day through this and uh, that's way too many, so. Thank you, Allison. Handing it over to Barbara. Okay, so I'll start this next question. And again, if Senator, when, when Senator Murkowski joins, then we'll just sort of stop and then resume. Um, so this next question is for Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, we know that public schools tend to have a wider lens on homelessness than many other agencies because every school district is required to designate a liaison to identify and enroll regardless of where children and youth are staying. And also we know schools tend to see kids day after day and year after year. So the question really is, what does homelessness look like for children and families in your community, particularly right now in the wake of COVID-19? And how do the different definitions of homelessness impact the support, the support that's available to them? Yeah, thank you. Um, so for, for our community, um, Minneapolis is in Hennepin County, and Hennepin County has a really strong homeless response system for families. Um, a large number of shelter beds we have compared to other counties, both locally and nationally. So we're one of very few places that have a right to shelter policy for families, meaning that if you're a family with children, you have a right to shelter as long as you are eligible. 
So even given that, homelessness in our community is dramatic. Um, and so one of the things that we see are, you know, kids who are more worried about where they're going to sleep at night than their schoolwork. And we see that play out in education outcomes. One in five of our students who are enrolled in this coming year have experienced homelessness at some point during their time in our district. Um, so we have families that are um, using all of their money to pay for a motel, keeping a motel going as long as they can. And when that money runs out, um, they might stay with a family member or someone else that can give them some space. Um, and so it's just a lot of bouncing around. Um, right now, my team is making calls to over 700 students who we knew were in unstable housing situations at the end of the school year. And most of those families are just asking us to call back in August because they have no idea where they're gonna be even next week. Um, so there's nothing stable about the situation. It was hard before COVID and it is beyond daunting um, during the pandemic. Um, so the, the definition of homelessness, I think really does impact the support that's available to families. Over half of our 2,500 students um, in Minneapolis public schools last year who experienced homelessness were not homeless by HUD's definition. So these students were living in self-pay motels or doubled up, um, which are not included in the federal definition of homelessness. So this means that 1,400 of our homeless students did not qualify for any housing support through our county's coordinated entry process. Um, and coordinated entry is the main way that our homeless families access affordable supportive housing options. Um, so these students sometimes end up remaining homeless for months and sometimes even years. Um, during the COVID crisis, the dynamic has actually gotten even worse because our shelter numbers are actually going down, meaning that even less of our families qualify for support. Um, right now, compared to last year, at this same time, we're seeing a 59 family decrease or a 184 person decrease in our Hennepin County shelter system. And don't get me wrong, that does not mean that people are not experiencing homelessness. We're seeing a lot of families um, really nervous about going to congregate settings. And so they're staying in really difficult and challenging situations, doubling up, paying for motels, um, sometimes staying in unsafe domestic situations to avoid coming into shelter. And I think that's a perfect example of how the definition matters um, because declining shelter numbers during COVID now means that less of our families are able to access a lot of the housing supports that are available um, for those that meet HUD's definition of homelessness. So I think it, um, it impacts different communities differently. Um, one example is just that there's a county next door to ours of similar size and their shelter system is dramatically smaller and it's literally always full. And so much like other shelters around the country, um, so they have an even higher percent of families who are doubled up and in turn a higher number of students who don't qualify for support. So I, I really just, I, I challenge the notion that uh, that a count of those in shelter is an accurate reflection of the housing needs of a community. And I, I think that what that really reflects is a community's investment in emergency shelter. And so um, understanding the context of that definition, I think, matters a lot. And that, that's where schools, I think, can come in and play an important role in identifying the needs of a community. Um, one example, just recently, I've, I was working with a family who had Four, of, four kids staying in one bedroom of a relative's apartment unit, and they were, had been there for six months. So this parent was working, but not making enough to afford a place on her own. And this family member allowed them to stay in their housing, but they had to be super quiet. They had to sneak in and out because they really were not supposed to be living in this unit. Um, so we were able to, through an initiative in Minneapolis called Stable Homes, Stable Schools, um, that's a partnership between the city and the county and our school district, we were able to provide them housing, but that is not, that's not usually available for families. And so a family like that could end up staying in a situation like that for a very long time. And that's being played out in neighborhoods across our country. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen mattresses and bedding tucked behind couches and stored anywhere that there's space during the day so that families can have a place to sleep at night. And I just think we cannot continue to have that be our community's response to homelessness. Um, 
if we want to provide housing resources to those that need it the most, we really need to understand how each community experiences homelessness and the definition of homeless um, needs to be broad enough to respond to the varied needs within each community, um, which is critical for our, our youngest community members and students who are experiencing homelessness every day. Thank you very much, Charlotte. I think we just got note that Senator Murkowski is dialing in now, so we're going to pause. Or maybe Darla, you should, we'll, we'll go on and then we'll pause when she's actually here. Okay. Uh, Brennan, uh, you provide services in the state of South Carolina. Could you share with us um, a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted the health, safety, well-being of the children, youth, and families that you serve? Absolutely. Thank you, Darla, for the question. Um, just yesterday, the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control announced 1,870 new confirmed cases of COVID-19, putting the total of confirmed cases to over 73,000. And, you know, as our state operates in South Carolina and Alabama, um, you know, the CDC has listed South Carolina and Alabama as numbers 9 and 10 of uh, cases of infection over the past seven days. So, um, you know, that, that's really growing. Uh, the, the needs are growing in our community in terms of the, the rates of infection. Uh, but with that being said, an overwhelming majority of the young people and families we serve are in the population groups that are at greater risk for infection. Um, those are families that have jobs that may not have been closed, but they're jobs that are in high risk or high exposure uh, industries, uh, retail, food service, maybe even healthcare. And so that significantly jeopardizes the, the health of those, uh, those who are in those fields, but also the people around them. And uh, on top of that, the lack of childcare options or the risks associated with those current options certainly increase the challenges that our families are facing. And most of them don't have the jobs that allow them to work from home while balancing the childcare. Uh, additionally, we have issues with our testing. Although the testing availability seems to have increased in some areas, the time between testing and getting the results, as well as the inadequate ability for folks to quarantine, especially those people who are homeless or couch surfing, um, that continues to increase those safety risks that we're experiencing down here as well. But then also access to basic health care. Adequate mental health care for many of the people we serve is, is really declining. Telehealth options are available, but they're not, not, not necessarily possible for all of our, our families and our children who don't necessarily have that technology. And so we have technology concerns. We have transportation concerns. Um, doctor's offices may not be seeing people face to face or taking new patients. And so those health needs are, are still there and uh, they're just going to, we believe they're just going to grow with these numbers of our infection. So for us, this is essentially a question of whether or not we can, can or we will meet the, uh, the needs of our community members with the essential safety and basic needs that, that our folks have. Um, COVID-19 has really increased those roadblocks in our communities, and we're working now to find different options to, to make that better. So as I speak, I, I speak more about the prevention for homelessness and prevention for these crisis situations for our, our families. Our, our agency works with a broad range of young people and families throughout the communities, and what we're seeing is just increased challenges uh, with all of our people that we serve based on the, uh, the needs of COVID-19. Thank you, Brendan. We're gonna pause one moment. The Senator is on, trying to pull her up.
Uh, how about if I go ahead and ask the next question and I'll let you uh, troubleshoot the, yeah. the, the system. Okay, so Melissa, the next question is for you. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, um, and Charlotte talked a little bit too about the impact of COVID-19 on school and school closures on our, our nation's children and youth. And we know that prior to COVID, school was one of the few safe, stable places in the lives of homeless students and maybe the only agency that was seeing and serving them. So how has COVID-19 impacted students experiencing homelessness in Kansas City, and especially your ability to even identify them and enroll them? How has it impacted their health, safety, and access to learning? Well, thanks, Barbara, for the question. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I am currently sitting in our boardroom uh, in the process of trying to uh, really, you know, get in, uh, get our students enrolled in. Um, much like Charlotte and Minneapolis, we've been um, trying to call our families, um, but I don't know if Charlotte has the same issue that I have here in Kansas City, but the phone numbers are only as good as the moment that they gave it to us. Uh, so having rotating phone numbers, actually trying to get in touch with our families has always been a definite challenge for us, but um, COVID has added an extra layer on there because not only do we not know 100% where our um, students and transition families are, but we also don't really know where all of our students are. We haven't seen them since um, the week before spring break, um, that Friday. And so with that being said, we're very much concerned because we, we know that um, during the pandemic when we were all shut down as far as the city is concerned, shut down as well. And so therefore they put evictions on hold. But as soon as June 1st hit, when um, cities start opening back up, evictions are now back on. And so with that being said, uh, we know that families that weren't homeless prior to spring break are currently going to be experiencing some form of homelessness because they're going to be uh, evicted or they're going through that whole formal eviction process where their stuff is being set out on the street. So we are super concerned uh, just about all of our families, not just our, our, our students, our McKinney Vento students, our students experiencing some form of homelessness. Our shelters have had um, huge outbreaks with the virus that our city has even gone so far into making sure that they have play, provided a um, safe space or a clean space so that our shelter families can recover. So they actually bought rooms in uh, one of the local motels in which our families would have been staying in. And so um, just really, we, we're not real sure where they are at this particular point in time, other than going out and just, you know, trying to go knock on doors, which isn't necessarily the safest thing for us to do. That's all we're, we're led to at this particular point in time. So we're just, we're trying to get in touch with everyone. And then um, also at the same time, you know, our superintendent was just on the radio this morning trying to reach our families um, through the radio, because again, at this point in time, we don't know what our school system is going to look like. We know we have a virtual option. We also know that there's supposed to be an in-person option as well, but we have capacity numbers that we didn't nor normally have in the classroom um, that are less than what the, the standard education says or the uh, Department of Education says is recommended. So if we're doing half that and then we're doing half of virtual, we're still missing those students. And much like Brennan said, there is a huge digital divide that is a problem uh, in our urban areas. Because if I'm saying that this family is going to provide a virtual option, the other issue is do they have the technology and the capacity in order to continue to learn with that um, teacher being there uh, on the video screen, much as this? Yes, it provides a convenience, and we know that we can reach some families that way. But at the same time, how stable is it? Is it something that is really going to promote that social emotional uh, learning that we are trying to provide and, and instill into our students? I mean, we have so many additional barriers that keep coming up that every day we think we have a solution to an issue. And then tomorrow we're like, nope, that didn't work. We got to try something else. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melissa. I believe we have Senator Murkowski now. Do we have audio, Senator? You, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, it is my 
It is my honor to introduce Senator Lisa Murkowski. Senator Murkowski has been a longtime champion and leader for children, youth, and families. And we're so grateful for her leadership and her tireless work with us to move forward the type of system change that our young people and our children need. So I'll hand it over to you, Senator Murkowski. Well, thank you, Darla. Um, and thank you to all of you that are on the, on the call this afternoon. Um, for your advocacy, for your advocacy for, for our kids and, and the most vulnerable of our, of our youth. Uh, I apologize that I'm a little bit late, but um, one of the things that I have learned throughout COVID is that I am not as technologically gifted as I would like to be. And so I've got different formats and uh, uh, what I really need are, are young teenagers around me to, to kind of help navigate, but um, I appreciate this important conversation today, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you've already had an opportunity to hear from my partner and colleague, uh, Senator Manchin, on what we are working to do with the Emergency Family Stabilization Act. Um, it's important to have good partners on legislative initiatives. It's important to have good partners across the aisle. This is, this is something that as the Senator from West Virginia and the Senator from Alaska, both places that have, have significant rural populations, um, that have populations that really are vulnerable, where we see far too many of our young people who are homeless, where we see families who um, may be part of the chronic homeless uh, community, but also those who have um, just recently mm -hmm. become homeless because of a host of, of different issues. Um, I want to, to, to personally acknowledge and recognize my friend, Allison Keir, who is uh, part of your panel today uh, as the executive director of Covenant House Alaska. Um, she is not only a leader in, in the community, but she is a leader and a role model when it comes uh, to, to our youth and our homeless particularly. What we see in Covenant House in terms of meeting just the day-to-day -day basic needs, whether it is a, a, a decent meal, whether it's a shower, whether it's a clean set of clothes, medical attention, a safe place to get off the streets, Covenant House has been doing this for a couple decades now, um, but it doesn't happen uh, just because you have the building. It happens because you have extraordinary people that are committed to making it happen. And, and she is, is able to do so much for our at-risk youth. And it's not just for, for, for those in the, in the Anchorage community. If you've not been to Alaska, we've got about half of our state's population in the Anchorage area, um, but uh, when it comes to services, that, that Anchorage area provides services literally for people all over the state of Alaska. And it's a big state, one-fifth the size of the United States. And, and so they come in to, to, to Anchorage. They, the young people come to Covenant House seeking that, that safe place. And when, when we think about all that, that, uh, that, our, our homeless kids are, are faced with, whether it is um, the predation that we see on the streets, the violence that we see on the streets, the trafficking. Um, now you overlay COVID-19 on top of an inherently uh, dangerous situation. And, and, and we see the jeopardy to, to the health and safety of our kids, our, our, our young people and our families. And my fear is that what we are seeing now is just kind of a forerunner to what we're going to be seeing later, that we're going to see a, a new wave of, of family and youth homelessness. Um, we are working here in the Senate to try to build out a fourth coronavirus um, relief package. And, and some of the things that we're looking specifically to are individual direct assistance um, uh, and, and 
what what more needs to be done with unemployment. But my fear is that um, in places like Alaska, where we have very seasonal, um, uh, it's very seasonal economy, we're we're going to have people who are 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 going to be living on the edge or pushed into homelessness because the jobs that they that they once had whether in the tourism sector or perhaps in the fisheries or perhaps construction that again is only seasonal that they're not going to make it through the winter that we're going to have a lot of very vulnerable people who are on the streets in Alaska in the winter time this is not a good place to be and so you know, we we are looking i am looking very specifically to what we can do to to help those who for whom right now they may have just just become homeless um, or or again maybe on the the edge and we see this this wave coming on you know with the initial cares package we did include some funding um, for homelessness um, but what what we learned all too soon was that far too many of, of our children and, and our youth who are experiencing homelessness were not eligible for the CARES funding um, because they're not eligible for most of the services that are provided by HUD's emergency solution grant the dedication fund um, dedication. So you know when you when you look at at the, the gap out there, you, you've got assist for, for the adult homeless individual, but what about, what about these families? What about these young people? And so what we need to be doing and what our emergency, um, uh, emergency Family Stabilization Act is designed to do is to provide that dedicated funding through the programs and the systems that are best possession position to meet the needs of, of homeless children and youth and their families and and then allow them that long-term stability so um, I, I think about some of the things that I was listening to as I was struggling to come live before you um, thinking about about our schools right now and the role that our schools play in in providing that safety net, if you will, for for so many uh, so many of our homeless young people, and and just the uncertainty that our schools are facing right now. So again, to bring it back to Alaska, um, if you're saying okay, you're going to be receiving all your instruction online, uh, we're going to we're going to see a real uh, inequity in terms of being able to to access you might be able to get that laptop but if you have internet or Wi-Fi that that will will hook you up um, I'd be surprised I am very concerned about uh, about just the, uh, the, the the gap that uh, we will see um, in in services then for for that homeless student who does a pretty good job of, of keeping the fact that he or she is homeless um, a secret from their friends, a secret from their teachers, a secret from everyone. And it just is through, through the grace of God sometimes that somebody is able to, uh, to have that conversation and realize that we've got a child who is is severely at risk, and how we can be there for them. When we're trying to do this all remotely, when uh, when we don't have that teacher um, who is, is 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 seeing the kids as they're coming in, I, I worry about the additional exposure that uh, that our, these children will face um, with uncertainty with schools reopening. I've talked for far longer than than I was supposed to or that I should, um, but know that I am. I, I I sincerely want to be your advocate here uh, in in the Senate, uh, along with my friend and colleague Senator Manchin. Uh, what you are working on every day, the 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 
the effort that you are making to reach out to as many of these young people and, and give them that, that fair chance that they deserve to be safe and, and to be protected. And that comes with the ability to, uh, to, to have a place that you can call a home. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for, for helping us out with, with our um, Emergency Family Stabilization Act. Uh, we want to get this in. We want to make we want to make some headway here, and we'll do it with your help. So thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Murkowski, for taking the time to be here with us today. Your passion and commitment to affecting policy change for children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness is so apparent. It really has been an honor to work with you and your team, and we look forward to continuing to work together. So thank you so much. Thank you. And and I know that, that uh, Anna Dietrich, um, who many of you have been working with, is, is, is on this line following this. Um, she's done a great job uh, with this measure and um, working together, we're, we're going to advance it. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Anna Spinoff, so thank you so much. Thanks. Now we are going to shift back to our panelists. And uh, the next question is for David, who hails from uh, San Diego, California. So tell us a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted the health, stability, and education of the young people, the children and families that you serve. Uh, great question, Darla, and uh, definitely happy to be uh, in San Diego right now because I hear that the weather is terrible everywhere else. We're sunny and 70 here, so enjoying that. Um, and thank you, uh, Senator Murkowski and Senator Manchin for being champions uh, for the youth. Um, we have all had to adapt in response to COVID-19 and uh, so many of our youth saw their entire lives change overnight. Um, you know, they can no longer access the computer labs where they would do their schoolwork. They can no longer access the day centers where they would decompress. Um, our young mothers and fathers can no longer access childcare. Um, and therefore must be a parent, a teacher, uh, you know, a chef, and all of that on top of whatever they do to earn money. Um, so uh, I'm sure a number of those people are on this very call playing two or three different roles right now. And I commend you um, because it is a challenge and a half. I mean, I've got two tortoises and I have hard, a hard time taking care of them while I'm on Zoom calls. So I can only imagine a child or, you know, another dependent. Um, so that's one way that we've seen youth uh, impacted, just sort of their whole systems are swept from under them and their routines are swept from under them. And uh, these are individuals who are already um, having a, a hard time, uh, you know, getting their needs met or, or hurdling their barriers. So um, we've been trying to fill those gaps as much as we can. Uh, but one positive way, I know it's kind of funny to say that, um, one positive way that we've seen youth impacted is that they are more curious than ever about uh, healthcare. So you, young adults and families, um, you know, they're actually asking, what is a primary doctor? And it's giving way to that conversation. Um, we've had young people even go to the hospital for COVID-19 testing and, uh, only to discover that they, that they have another serious health condition that needs to be addressed, right? So um, that's a bit of the silver lining that we see. and. Uh, you know, healthcare is something that is normally very private. Um, and so it's great to see that sort of brought into the scope of our work and provide one more layer, you know, one more layer of uh, support that we can, that we can, um, you know, sort of provide to these, to these young people, um, just educating them about healthcare and uh, getting them connected to these uh, primary doctors and helping them kind of navigate the, what it what to do after we uh, I can think of one individual who went into the uh, the doctors to get a COVID test and discovered that she had a very serious heart condition. From that point, her living in a living in a van, living in a car is no longer an option because she you know she can she has serious health problems that that, that environment can lead to her you know demise. So um, you know responding to those things and also 
uh, is setting up other sort of preemptive services to ensure that we're not waiting until they're evicted to have rental assistance. We're identifying those individuals who may need those services long before, getting them set up so that when the time does come, they don't have to um, experience homelessness or it can be brief and interrupted by the services that we've preemptively set up. Um, another significant impact that we've seen is um, some of our, our youth who are in the more rural areas are, are reaching out. It's sort of uh, the opposite of the digital divide that we've been seeing in other communities where they this is the time where they need help and they know it and the situation is so dire that they can uh, you know sort of overcome the uncomfortability of asking for help and people uh, in general are you know more uh, likely to to say hey I need a hand here I need some food I need some groceries so um, we've seen uh, a lot more people asking for help with this pivot and this adaption that's been necessary in response to COVID-19. Um, and, you know, we're here just like many of you all just doing the best that we can and trying to scramble up the resources. And it's certainly a lot easier when these resources are tied to uh, specific definitions or they're not tied to very rigid uh, eligibility requirements. And, um, you know, therefore it can kind of allow us to just get in there and and make a change. Um, so that's kind of what we've seen in our community and a bit of our response. I'm sure you'll hear more later on as we progress through this, but um, that's kind of San Diego in a nutshell with this whole COVID thing right now. Thanks, David. Hand it over to Barbara. All right. So Kim, the next question is for you. Uh, you know, I mentioned in, in the opening that the U.S. Department of Education estimates that 1.4 million children under the age of six experienced homelessness. That was pre-COVID. And of course, we know from all the research on early childhood about the lasting impacts of adverse childhood and specifically homelessness on later child development. So my question for you is, how has COVID-19 impacted infants, toddlers, and preschoolers who are experiencing homelessness in the counties that you work with? Um, and what kind of barriers has it posed to their health and development? and also to your ability as a Head Start, Early Head Start program to identify and recruit these children and families. Thank you, Barbara, yes. Um, first, I think I need to say that in um, the area that I'm in, in West Virginia, that I can talk directly about the children, but first I need to mention where the families are. So families have been impacted first, which ultimately in, impacts those young children because they're, uh, needing assistance or back pay for rent or back pay on utilities and which can get them into a, a homeless situation and um, when I speak on the children's behalf we're looking at the lack of care for um, clinics and um, big pediatricians and dentist offices that are shut down at this time or limited access to patients because they were closed for that time frame and they're behind so Children are missing well checkups, and they're missing um, immunizations. So we're behind a little bit in our area, just to keep children's health status current. So that's been um, one of the biggest impacts directly on children. And unfortunately, across the United States, I'm sure, children at this age lost the opportunity to socialize. So that social and emotional piece that comes with um, the early childhood opportunities that are provided to children are so valuable and they're missing that right now because not every home has another sibling to play with or to interact with so it might just be a lot of adults that they interact with or there's a lack of education from the parents so therefore there's no one to enrich that speech and language development or the parents on the cell phone and, and they're not paying attention to the child so there's a big difference in um, just the day-to-day -day things that happen for homeless children as well as our um, children in homes where parents are busy and um, or they're not parenting and they're not getting that support that we, we provide them throughout the year in our programming. The, um, the other thing is transportation to these um, visits for well baby checkups or dental care. We're not there and we're not able to transport due to COVID. So they're limited on being able to make it to those appointments as well as obtaining food and um, the necessities. Now our program has been able to deliver food and we can provide services to them, but the transportation is limited. And of course, we're not making home visits at this time 
due to COVID and we're not going into um, homeless areas to, um, to visit. So we're just having, it's, it causes a barrier for sure to be able to contact them, to reach them because they don't have a cell phone or they, they're not in a, a shelter where we can have that direct one-on-one -on -one contact. So let me piggyback that with recruiting. Recruiting is a huge um, obstacle for all of us because finding homeless families is difficult if they're truly, they meet that definition. But those who are that are couch surfing, it's very hard right now because they're going from one home to the other, trying to, uh, to save themselves from getting the, the virus. So we're seeing that too. And just where's the last place they slept? So we can get the initial paperwork completed so we can en enroll them into our programming. So it, it has been a, a real challenge and a, and a barrier to get to reach the homeless population right now. The other thing, and I know someone else has already spoken about this, is the Wi-Fi accessibility for virtual learning. Even as young as our preschool age group, we are communicating virtually through um, through different platforms to work with children and families. And if they don't have Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter if we provide them an iPad or a tablet of some sort. If they are unable to have Wi-Fi connection, then we're not able to provide the virtual learning opportunities to children. Thank you. So what we're going to do next is we have one last question for the panelists. And this question is now pivoting specific to the, specifically to the legislation that Senator Manchin and Senator Murkowski introduced and that they're championing the Emergency Family Stabilization Act, which is a new funding stream through the Administration for Children and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services, um, direct uh, federal to local, providing flexible assistance for housing-related, health-related, children's services-related needs uh, for the broader definition of homelessness, uh, and again, in this time of COVID. So, uh, with respect to this legislation, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask the panelists in the reverse order. So, Kim, I'm going to start with you um, and ask you, um, if this legislation were enacted, how would it help your Head Start and Early Head Start program stabilize children and families who are experiencing homelessness? Several of the things that I mentioned in, in my previous answer covers those things. We would have opportunities to provide transportation vouchers possibly a taxi, pay for a taxi or um, some type of transportation to get them to those, those appointments. We also would have the opportunity to um, connect them with housing related needs. So if there's a circumstance where they need um, some assistance in starting that first deposit on a, a house, we can re relocate them into a, a rental property. And then um, just thinking about the needs of pregnant women and children. So we know that we're getting them the, the care that they need and those are those early children that we get prior to. So prenatal care is so valuable and we wanna make sure that we connect those um, pregnant parents or pregnant moms, excuse me, to those providers and making sure they get prenatal care. Um, we also would like to think about you know, the possibility of having stout staffing for outreach, connecting them for those mental and substance abuse issues that they have. So um, having some funding to provide those type of services would be wonderful. And um, emergency child care, right now, a lot of, especially in the state of West Virginia, our child care centers have not reopened. So we have um, a lot of families who can't go back to work because they don't have child care. So that, that's an issue in our area. And then meeting the health and safety needs, whether that's um, providing them the PPE things that they need, food, hygiene items, and, um, the last thing I want to mention is that they would need um, education and training and employment opportunities. So connecting them with those resources out in the community so they can they can better themselves and, and hopefully get out of the homeless situation that they're in. Thank you. I think you're muted, Darla. And now, yeah, so sorry, <laughs> we, have a big, we have a big thunderstorm here, so I muted, so you didn't hear the thunder in the background. So uh, my, my question is for David. Uh, the Emergency Family Stabilization Act would provide 
direct flexible funding to community agencies to meet the emergency needs of youth who are homeless using the broader definition of homelessness. Um, so how would this help the young people that you serve? Um, great question, Darla. I think uh, it would allow us to step in earlier and provide some more of those prevention and diversion services. Um, many of the youth who we come in contact with um, are, are couch surfing or they're in situations that are a bit more gray area um, and therefore these sort of rigid eligibility requirements or these you know, definitions that don't necessarily encompass them. Um, it forces them to continue this lifestyle. And um, I, I always say that uh, couch surfing is the gateway to homelessness, just like couch surfing is a gateway to trafficking, couch surfing is a gateway to domestic violence. You know, it's, it's allowing us to step in earlier and, and really wrap around these youth and say, here you are, you're a human, you're not your experience, validate what they have going on and, and actually help. Uh, I, as a youth system navigator, I spend a ton of time um, every single day acquiring resources in the morning so that throughout the day I have it ready to go because these youth, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, they're, they're hard to get a hold of when they slip out of our hands. Um, after, you know, I get off the phone with the youth, their life could change just like that. You know, they could, they could go all the way across the country to another place. So in reality, um, you know, that safety net, um, those, that, that, those, that flex funding and these, these definitions, um, especially around uh, homelessness and chronic homelessness um, would really allow us to just open our doors and, and not only open our doors to keep youth in, but uh, it would prevent us from having to turn youth away and therefore sending them in the direction of other resources, like I mentioned earlier, the traffickers, these other situations that are subpar. Um, we wanna be who they come to uh, and we wanna be who helps them basically. Um, and that's what um, this funding would allow us to do. Thank you, David. Turn it over to Barbara. So Melissa, from a school district perspective, you know, the legislation um, is direct federal HHS um, to local community agencies, but school districts are eligible uh, recipients of this funding. And again, it's flexible, housing related, health related, child care related for this broader definition. How would, if this legislation passed, how would it uh, allow you to stabilize families and children in Kansas City? Um, that would be amazing because um, as a school district, we're not able to provide that direct connection to um, emergency housing. So we have uh, a mom that is fleeing a, a DV situation or a domestic violence situation where we would have to say, hey, you need to contact this particular resource to find out if they have space available for you and your eight kids or uh, you and your four kids. And so um, at times they don't. And so we're trying to help them ponder through uh, what additional resources they may have in their back pocket. But at the same time, if we can get that funding, then we will be in a position to say, okay, well, we may be able to provide um, that hotel motel stay for, you know, two days, three days until that, that shelter becomes available on a truly emergency basis. Um, that's our biggest challenge is that we have weather related challenges. Of course, you know, Kansas City, we get um, everything everything, ice, rain, um, snow, all of that. And so uh, oftentimes just having a safe place to sleep for a night or two is a bigger challenge. And so right now I have to currently rely on some of my continuums of care, um, but also um, we rely heavily up, upon our uh, religious community. So it, I'll call the church and say, hey, church XYZ, can you um, please provide a stay uh, for, you know, two days, three days, five days for this family and everything, because some of the shelters also don't allow for that, um, that paramour situation. They say that if the man and the woman are together or same sex are together, they need to be married. And so that also creates a barrier. So having access to that emergency funding will help us um, kind of put a band-aid on that immediate need of being housed uh, in a safe place uh, for a few days until we can reset and really, you know, 
find out what's available for them because most of the time that those families that do come and see us, this is the first time that they're experiencing homelessness. This is the first time that they are saying, I don't know what to do, but can you help me down that path? And so that would be the, the biggest thing right there um, as we continue to connect them to um, the agencies that help provide a lot of additional resources. Um, so helping trying to remove that immediate barrier to some type of immediate shelter. Thank you. Thank you. The next question we have is for Brennan. The Emergency Family Stabilization Act would allow service providers with expertise and experience in serving children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness um, to have access to fle flexible funds to, um, that can cover a myriad of needs. What would these resources allow you to do and, and what kind of impact could you have in your community? Thank you, Darla. Uh, in preparation for this briefing, I met with several providers um, of services for homeless youth in North Carolina and in South Carolina, uh, stakeholders and other providers, just to get their perspectives on some of the day-to-day -day challenges they're experiencing, but then also some of the gaps that they see. And so one of the things that just jumped out just uh, you know, across the board was emergency housing. Uh, needing emergency housing and support for some of our, our young people and our families that uh, that come through our doors, um, housing that could potentially be available for you know a couple of weeks while people are able to get things stable so they can move forward. Also, um, rental assistance and utility assistance; um, those are some of the major challenges. So when we're thinking about preventing homelessness, um, making sure that people have at least the opportunity to catch up on um, the rents because they didn't have the uh, employment during this time with COVID-19 that has just created some other challenges for them. Another piece of it is technology. You know, everyone's mentioned technology today, and that that is, I think, probably one of the major issues that we're having when we're thinking about education, when we're thinking about just uh, health care and other opportunities for people to stay safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, technology is, is critical. So ensuring that we could provide the necessary technology for some of our youth and families that we're serving. Another part of that is also just case management and outreach. You know, this is a brand new way of doing business across the, the country now. Uh, when we're talking about access to services for families, when we're helping young people figure out how to navigate from point A to point B, you know, the systems are different now. The way we do it is different. And people need the, a little bit of support in navigating those new, new systems and new challenges. And so in, in implementing case management programs and services for our young people and their families to make sure that they do have access to the services that are available is absolutely critical. And the other part of that, and I think the, um, the last piece is really just the access to additional staff members to provide that in-person counseling and therapy that our kids and families need. Um, you know, using telehealth and some of these other options that we have right now is definitely helpful. And it, it does meet a need and it fills a, a small gap that's there. But there are some folks who just don't have access to those uh, technologies. And then there are also people who just need a little more support. They need additional face-to-face -face contact. And um, having someone on staff or additional people on staff in some of our organizations across the country could really assist in that. But specifically in our South Carolina area, uh, our providers have said they need additional staff members to help their young people with that face-to-face -face counseling and therapy to address some of those challenges that we've all talked about today. Thank you, Brennan. Over to Barbara. All right. So, Charlotte, the next question is for you. We've been talking again about the Emergency Family Stabilization Act, which, you know, just to sort of compare and contrast, you know, we've got the different definitions. We've talked about those between the HUD definition, which excludes a lot of families and kids, and then we've got the broader education and early care definition, which this legislation encompasses. We've also got different delivery systems, you know, in terms of coordinated entry and that whole process versus a direct funding to agencies like schools, like early childhood programs, like community-based organizations who are working with families and youth. But there's another piece too, which is really that the Emergency Family Stabilization Act takes a, a kind of a, a takes a holistic two-generation approach to family homeless to family homelessness and authorizes funds for a variety of needs, housing included, but also children's services. 
So if you could speak to the importance of addressing children's needs in housing programs and how HEP, how EFSA, this legislation, would help you do just that in your community if it were enacted. Yeah, thank you. Um, so appreciate the, just the wisdom on this panel and also just the, um, the awareness of the needs of children and that advocacy um, from Senator Manchin and Senator Markowski, just really grateful um, for that focus. I, I do think as a community, our homeless response system really could do a better job of using outcomes specifically related to children. And I think so often we're we're only looking at the adult and the vulnerabilities of the adult. Um, and rarely are we are we looking specifically at children and the vulnerabilities of children. And I think that's short sighted. Um, we know that homelessness is generational and we're not going to end homelessness if we aren't paying really close attention to the needs of children in our community. Um, in Minneapolis, we have a, a really exciting rental assistance initiative called Stable Home, Stable Schools that intentionally prioritizes homeless families that don't qualify for our coordinated entry system. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a great example of a place where really focusing on the needs of children has had an impact. Um, at capacity, this program is going to serve 300 families and 15 schools, so it's significant, um, but even at that number, it's only going to reach about 25% of our eligible families in those schools. Um, but the reason I, I use that as an example is because the partnership that we have in that program, it's, it's government entities, it's service providers, housing authority, and our school district, and so we've all figured out how to work together um, to support families with that expanded definition of, of homelessness. And one of the things that I appreciate the most about that initiative is when we're referring families, we, we take a look at all of our eligible families. And when we see a pattern of low attendance, behavior concerns, uh, low proficiency in reading or math, or a lack of ability for the parent to engage with school, that's what we use to prioritize that family for housing support. Um, and so then we partner with the YMCA and the Housing Authority to help that family locate affordable housing within the bus zone of their school and provide ongoing wraparound support for that long-term stability. So we've seen really successful outcomes from that project so far. Um, school stability being maybe one of the, the most exciting parts. So we know that that, that school stability piece is so important. Um, and we've seen that actually families that are involved in this partnership had better school stability than our district average. So to put that in perspective, um, the district average for students who remained in their same school for the whole school year last year was 86%. Our students who are experiencing homelessness, their school stability rate was 65%. And families that were enrolled in this program had a 90% school stability rate. So I think it just shows like the importance of that partnership um, and really focusing on the needs of, of students specifically. Uh, we also had access to eviction prevention funds through that uh, initiative. And one of the things I know, I know that there's lots of different pathways for eviction prevention. But what I thought was powerful about having it come through the school is that not only did it um, prevent homelessness, but it also built a stronger connection to school and gave us at the school level another tool to stabilize families and then enhance stabilize our school communities that often some of our schools have 50% of the students in a, in a specific school have, had, have experienced homelessness at some point during their their time in our school district. That's a huge percent of a school community dealing with that level of trauma and that instability. Um, so Stable Home, Stable Schools, I think it's just, it's an example of a place where having a two generational approach and the flexibility to respond to housing related needs um, is just one example of, you know, how I envision similar success with the EFSA legislation. Um, it's a way to capture the needs of students um, and I think that just becomes even more important when home becomes, um, it's always been a symbol of safety, but in the middle of a pandemic, it just is so much more critical. And I think just really a call for us to do things differently. Thank you. Great, and our final question is for Allison. The Emergency Family Stabilization Act would provide flexible funding and would direct 
specific portions of the money to tribal and rural communities. Why is this needed and how would ESPA help rural and tribal communities in Alaska? Oh, you're muted, I think. I need a teenager around me as well to do uh, my technology. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, you know, the, the key word um, in this is the flexible dollars. I mean, uh, I, in Alaska, um, the Alaska Native community is disproportionately represented in homelessness. It's less than 12% of our overall population. But in my program alone, it's about 60% of the people that we serve are Alaska Native. So there's a disproportionate amount. Um, and I think that oftentimes, uh, due to the conflicting definitions and the dollars can be used for this, but not for that, that there we're, you know, we're prolonging the experience or we're, in a sense, putting a young person in a space that they're not homeless enough. Right. And so I think that for me, uh, the flexible dollars is the key to this and the, the and the definitions um, and really getting some work done on making this consistent because our young people, uh, we've, you know, we have side by side, we're working with our young people and they have been the best, um, you know, advising us on how to help them navigate through um, homelessness. But yet it's it's a dollar it's a it's a our limited capacity to do what we need to do because the dollars are so rigid or restrictive um that that i, I think this this could potentially you know be a game changer and i would love for um our organization not to be considered a shelter but maybe an education and employment center that offers housing right i'm, I'm ready to get out of the homeless business in a sense that it, it we really we know what it takes um to support our young people and uh it's a it's a co financial capacity issue um that we this this act could um you know really change change their lives and, and it wouldn't just be a a, a vision of ending uh, the experience of homelessness for our young people it's going to be a statement and a fact and so i'm i've been working with senator mikowski on this and she's an amazing champion for young people um, and she has spoken to many of our young people and the one thing that they say is that you know it, it's crazy sometimes they might be able to get this service but they can't get that service and what what's that all about um so i, I to me is i think it's about the flexibility and how it's going to help us is to be able to kind of serve across the state in a broader, more effective way. Thank you, Allison. I'm going to hand it over to Barbara, who's going to go through some of our policy priorities, and then we're going to go to Q&A. Just a reminder to please put your questions in. We have some already, um, but please feel free to, to pop them in there. All, All right. right. Next slide. So just very quickly, we've talked a lot today. In fact, one of the main purposes of this briefing was to explain the Emergency Family Stabilization Act and how it would directly respond to child, youth, and family homelessness during COVID-19. Uh, so I won't say more about that. Uh, this slide does have a hyperlink to more information about the legislation, fact sheets, and how you can take action. But also wanted to, to say that we know that there are very many complex challenges from technology to education, employment, nutrition, and our organizations do support a broader range of policy proposals around COVID-19 in this next legislation. We're focusing on these specific, specific asks because we know that the emergency response system also must be as sensitive to and reflect the way that children, youth, and families actually experience homelessness in the systems that they're most connected to. So in addition to EFSA, uh, we are also advocating for $500 million for the Education for Homeless Children and Youth program to be included in the next COVID legislation. Again, as we've heard from our two liaisons, these are, schools are among the only systems that are seeing universally what families and children and youth are going to. And if there isn't somebody who's identifying, connecting to school, connecting to resources, then these children and youth have no access to education at all. And it doesn't matter what other resources are there, they're not connected. So we need to make sure that we see the Education for Homeless Children and Youth program as a critical part of the emergency response as it was in Katrina 
as it was in the 2017 hurricanes, it too must be a focus of this next legislation. Also, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program, and again, we've heard David and Allison and Brennan talk about the importance of specifically serving runaway and homeless youth in that specific program, which provides street outreach, drop-in centers, short and longer-term housing. Um, and Allison, I love the idea of, a, of an education and employment center that also does housing in terms of the reframing, because what is our goal in the end, if not economic independence, self-sufficiency, and everything we want for every single child? So RHYA does all of that. And these programs, as we've heard, have, have seen a tremendous increase in need with COVID-19, and we know with the e economic downturn that that will, will continue. So we're asking Congress to direct $300 million in funding for RHYA new and existing programs in the next supplemental. So again, you've got links on the website or on the PowerPoint there that, that connect directly to um, those advocacy calls. And now we've got time, we've got 15 minutes for questions and answers. So I'm gonna um, be texting Darla those questions and Darla's gonna be asking our panel. Oh, All first, right. it's a little commercial advertisement. For the next two slides are just about the, the recordings for the, for the uh, previous briefings. So, so Darla, take it away. Okay, thank you, Barbara. And if you did miss the first two briefings, I really encourage you to listen to the recordings. They're very powerful. Um, and I certainly learned a lot. Uh, so the first question we have for our panelists, and just feel free to raise your hand or start talking if you wanna answer the question is, um, can any of you address how you have been serving LGBTQ youth during uh, the coronavirus pandemic? I can kind of jump in on that. Um, okay. We, uh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt somebody? Pardon me. Uh, uh, we have been um, really intentional about um, kind of spreading our message on social media because we have seen our LGBT youth kind of go back into their shell, um, especially with things like Donald Trump, you know, making changes to the equal access rule through HUD, right? And we're seeing these sort of anti-LGBTQ things coming out. Um, so we have, we have just been making sure to engage them where they are. Um, and that's places like Instagram, Facebook, um, and uh, letting, these youth know in particular we're here for you um nothing has changed from us regardless of what you know the political climate of the nation may be we'll be here for you um providing them that safe space digitally which is a little bit tough but uh one way that we've done that is having uh sort of like an lgbtq uh power hour on zoom right where we bring our youth and we just have them share hey what are you going through and that way, not only can they connect with, you know, the community, but also give us an idea of how can we continue to reach these particular individuals and, um, you know, address the needs of this subpopulation that's very different than other uh, subpopulations of youth, right? These are specific um, individuals who need specific resources who need specific solutions so kind of taking the time to shine the spotlight on lgbtq specifically and being very intentional with our language even and and everything to ensure that they are welcome or they feel welcome um and again in really uplifting our lgbtq uh, youth advocates locally elevating their voices to our county supervisors to ensure that you know uh it's a for us, by us sort of solution as opposed to someone from the outside looking in and trying to solve problems that they don't know about. Um, so that's kind of one way we've been uh, uh, getting involved with our LGBT youth specific, LGBTQ youth um, specifically. Also educating, uh, we had a, a training on pronouns because through Zoom it can be difficult, right? It's difficult to address uh, folks properly. So. We, we, we brought our, our youth advocates in and we and they facilitated an excellent and informative uh, training about pronouns that that circulated through our you know provider network and therefore kind of advanced all of our understanding uh, together and so that's sort of where we've been relying on our community partners um, to 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 bring those youth to the table and bring them to the table and allowing them to come up with their solutions on their own because nobody knows better than they do. So. 
Thank you, David. You mentioned, and someone did ask a question about the proposed change to HUD's equal access rule. Um, and I did want to clarify. So um, it is a rule is another word for regulation. And the proposed change would allow um, homelessness service providers to discriminate against transgender um, people. Uh, so there is a campaign that we are a part of, housingsaveslives.org. You can sign up. The comment period hasn't opened yet. Um, when it does, everybody who signs up will receive information and there will also be draft comments that you can submit in opposition to the proposed rule change. But what I do want to clarify for folks is even if the rule does change, it doesn't require or mandate that service providers discriminate against trans or any LGBT individuals, but it would allow. Um, we are opposing it because we never want any LGBTQ young people or, or people of any age to perceive that they would be discriminated against or not um, treated in a welcoming and affirming a way when trying to access services. Um, so anyhow, housingsaveslives.org, sign up, you'll get more information and you can be um, part of the group of us that is submitting comments in opposition to the change. Um, and the other, the next question we have um, for Allison, I think. Um, so the question is, our agency works with families experiencing homelessness. We provide multi-generational services, but we have found it to be very challenging to report student outcomes outside of student outside of school outcomes, such as attendance, behavior, grades. In our district, we're unable to report on school data. So I was curious what outcomes some of the non-school programs report on for their youth. Um, that's a great question. Um, and we report on a lot of different things. I mean, our outcomes, we watch uh, employment, we watch were um, stable housing, what percent of our young people exit into stable housing. Uh, we track our ability to, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, I mean, it, we, we actually have a school on our campus. And so it's, it's kind of confusing because we get a lot of our information we share with the school district on it. So it, it is about, uh, their stability. So we look at all the things that are le are leading itself to their stability, such as employment and, you know, uh, interactions with families. We're able to track their, we have navigators with each youth. So we are able to track the visits that they have um, and some of their, some of their efforts. Thanks, Allison. David, Brennan, did you want to share anything around outcomes? Actually, our outcome tracking is, is very similar to um, what Allison just presented. Um, we also uh, look at uh, health care and uh, mental health stability um, you know, changes mm -hmm. that um, whether positive or negative, but um, in terms of the homelessness, um, really the exit to um, stable, permanent stable housing is I think really critical. All those other components that go along with it, with employment and career readiness and um, the other aspects of uh, the supports that are necessary to have stable housing are, are also recorded. Great, the next question is for Melissa and or Charlotte. Um, so the question is, please comment on safe parking um, and students and families needs for shelter safe parking lots, for example, a department store or a local church parking lot um, seems to be a trend to address emergency shelter or small tiny houses. Um, what are your comments for student well-being and access to school support services while in a safe parking program, especially families who are evicted from housing um, and domestic violence situations? Um, uh, it's funny that you talk about the question is talking about safe parking because that's actually something that I've been um, my team and I have been trying to pursue within our city um, with some of our um, elected officials um, 
both um, locally in our state. And so we don't exactly know what safe parking looks like uh, for Kansas City, um, but we do know that it is being done in California. So we know that and we're super excited about it, uh, but we also know that that comes with some additional liabilities because what we envision is it to have a safe parking park, uh, partnering with uh, one of our agencies so that facilities are still um, available um, within that parking lot, so to speak, um, that surface lot that they may be, um, that it's still patrolled and then have some of those regular agencies um, that are usually only open um, Monday through Friday, you know, eight to five regular, regular business hours to provide those services to those um, those car loads right there um, at that uh, at that parking lot, and it, it will have like a, a dust to dawn operating hours. So we we thought about it tremendously, but um, just trying to get players at the table uh, within our city so that we can come up with uh, a viable function for a safe parking. Um, hasn't been successful, but I haven't given up um, because I continue to go on and, and talk about it every chance we get. We get uh, we elected new mayor, and I'm like, hey, I want to be able to talk to you about safe parking because we already know our families are parking um, in some of in some of our touristy spots, uh, and to distinguish safe parking from uh, like overnight travel parking or RV parking or camping parking that it is not that this is this is a family that is experiencing homelessness and they happen to be living in their car and they need somewhere to park. So in the meantime, um, we come across our families that are um, living in their vehicle. Um, we try to direct them to the safest place to park and we tell them, you know what, park around one of our buildings because we know it's being patrolled. Thank you, Charlotte. You know, Hennepin County, like as I mentioned before, has a right to shelter policy for families. And so um, I can't say that we've done a lot of exploring around that. When, I guess the thing that I could comment on is just one of the things that we've been seeing in our community, mostly with singles, but some with families, is um, encampments in our parks. And one of the things that I could relate the parking example to is just the benefit of actually having a place where services could then be provided. So similar to what Melissa was saying, just that ability for people to be in a safe space where service providers can reach them. Um, so that's, I guess that's in our community, the closest I can get to responding on that one. Thank you, Charlotte. The next question is for Kim. How has Head Start, Early Head Start, worked to prioritize homeless children for enrollment during the coronavirus? So um, anytime that we take an application on a homeless child, their criteria points are significantly higher to any other child who may have um, a lower income level. So the homeless population is, is placed into a classroom as soon as possible. So those children are served right away. Thank you, Kim. And I think that is all we have time for. I'm gonna pass it over to Barbara to close us out. Thank you all. Sure, and just, I just actually saw one last question that I, that I will answer myself, which is, how will these funds, EFSA funds, be connected to the continuum of care? These are separate from the continuum of care. So this is a, a direct, again, federal to local, doesn't go through the COC, so we're not um, bound by HUD's rules because this is not a HUD program. It's coming from a different federal agency with different definitions um, and different ways of serving families. So that's, that's the short answer is, um, again, this is not going to go through the continuum of care. It's gonna go directly to community agencies. Um, and then again, just to finish up, uh, we have resources for you here, websites to all of our organizations and newsletters. Um, and again, we have lots of action alerts and ways to take action. The next two to three weeks are absolutely essential. I would say the next two weeks are very essential for our advocacy around all of these asks as Congress rolls up its sleeves and hopefully gets to serious work on the next COVID-19 legislation, which is so desperately needed to meet the needs of our children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. I wanna say thank you 
to all of our amazing panelists and presenters for taking the time to be with us today. We're so grateful to you for, for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, and also, of course, to our senators for joining us to talk about the legislation that they put so much into already and are working so hard to get to the finish line. So thanks, everybody. Again, the recording will be out soon. You'll get an email um, with that information. And feel, feel, feel free to contact any of us later if you have additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Wow.